Welcome everyone. I, uh, I'm uh, actually quite pleased to see a, a, a good turnout here, especially on uh, such a nice day. It's uh, hard to be inside. I know. Um, I'm excited to be here. This is a really sort of, um, as Nick said, this is kind of represents a new line of work for me in my, in my research, in my own sort of uh, journey as a, as a scholar, um, as an academic, and in some ways an activist. Um, I have historically looked at couple of financial aid and, and student success, both in terms of getting into college and through college, and I've really sort of been interested in financial aid in particular. And so uh, over the years, as I sort of was doing that work, and as I've advanced my career a little bit, I kept coming to this conclusion, right? And it's not, it's not my conclusion, you see it in the literature, and you sort of see it in, in your own work at times, but uh, financial aid is necessary, but not sufficient for student success, right? And so, uh, at the same time as I'm, I'm doing this work, and I'm sort of um, looking at financial aid, uh, I was a foster parent. And, so, and that sort of changed the ways in which I looked at kind of some of the questions around policy. And, and this is sort of a no-brainer, perhaps, to many of you in the room, but it really sort of struck me how much about the success of someone in college or university really is a lot. It's about a lot of factors and a lot of things that go into sort of that student and that student's trajectory to that point. Right? And so for me, sort of looking at former foster youth in higher ed is one way to think about a, a specific population of folks in higher ed and how different policies and programs and supports touch on that population and intersect. So that's kind of where I'm coming at this stuff from. So I, um, be before I get going, I just want to have sort of, a, it would be helpful for me to have a sense of maybe who's in, in the room a little bit. Um, how many of you sort of uh, work, I assume all of you work in education in some respect, right? How many of you sort of work in social work, child welfare, early childhood development, couple folks. How many of you have sort of experiences working with social uh, welfare systems at all or, or interacting with those? A few, okay. I just want to get a sense of that because I, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time providing my sort of overview of, sort of my understanding of how the foster care systems work. But I also want to know that because you all are probably going to be more expert in, in sort of the child and social welfare systems than me in some ways. Um, I, I'm sort of again coming at this as a, as a higher ed scholar. Um, when I started sort of getting into, the, into this topic, I was, I was pretty naive. Right? I thought, okay, well, I, I want to look at this group of, of students, and I'm used to having really big data sets from states and from the federal government to work with. Um, and sometimes these data sets can be messy, but there's a lot of information in there. And so, like, like any good scholar, I sort of went out and started to do, uh, you know, do my literature reviews and, and try and find the previous work on this population, and, that, and it didn't take too long to figure out, of course, that former foster youth uh, go to college at pretty low rates compared to peers, very low rates, in fact, we'll talk more about that, um, and they're less likely to graduate. And so I wanted to go out and look at the literature, and I was really sort of struck, and this wasn't a, a systematic review or meta-analysis or anything very um, super rigorous in terms of going back to the research, but I just wanted to sort of get a sense of, well, what's been written in my field on former foster youth in higher ed? So I did a search of the top three journals, I'm not sure uh, how fuzzy that is back there, but I went back 18 years in the top three journals in the field, just looking for keywords on foster youth, uh, or former foster youth, and I found uh, four articles in our top journals that had a mention of former foster youth in higher ed. And by mention, I really just mean mention, because it's a variable in one of the data sets, but they weren't That really, frankly, annoyed me, right? Because it, for, for a couple of reasons. Primarily because you don't have to have a lot of people for something to be important, right? Um, but also, I thought, no, that, that can't be the case. So I went and I just did some back the envelope math here and looked at the census data. And, and you know, if you look at it, the proportion of former fo or foster youth in the US population 18 and under are 5% of the population in 2012, compared to Native Americans, uh, American Indians, Alaskan Natives. 1%. And so I got curious and I went and looked at the top journals again to see how much we were writing about that group in the top journals. And to be clear, it's not enough. We don't know enough about our indigenous students. And we have a lot to address, but we've done a lot more in the field on this. So I, I was really sort of struck by this. And this really made me think about, wow, okay, so maybe there isn't a lot out here on this. So how am I going to look at this? So what I really started to, to do was, you have to go to the, the social work literature, right? And what I found in the literature was that actually a lot of the studies, there's some good studies out there, but they tend to be some are pretty small samples. So 55 students, 
probably one of the biggest is the um, Chapin Hall study done at the University of Chicago where they followed, I think, about 900, uh, maybe 1,200 students or, or form foster youth through to graduation and beyond to sort of see what happened in terms of all their sort of outcomes. Um, but there hasn't really sort of been a, a, a national systematic look at this uh, topic about how our former foster youth are doing in higher ed. So, um, so what I was able to pull from the literature, it, frankly probably, in, to those of you who have done some work in this area familiar with this, is, is probably isn't a, a huge surprise. So foster youth, former foster youth, are less likely to be on an academic trajectory to go to college. Right? And I, I want to point out her uh, Wendy Bloom's analysis. Now, this was her dissertation. And I was reading this, and I was trying to figure out where she got these data, so I called her. And uh, she's, she's much further along in her career, and she's shifted areas at this point. I think she does social work, and it's not my area, but I think she does some uh, pretty significant work in that area. The sample she used from high school and beyond, it's a federal data set, was, I think there were a couple hundred students in there, in that sample, <coughs> but nobody could tell me what variables they actually used to run this, run this analysis. But this, was one of, this is one of the more cited <coughs> studies uh, in, in terms of looking at former foster youth. When I talked to the statisticians at IES, Institute for Education Sciences about that data set, they advised me not to use it. Because they said they didn't think it was reliable and the overall sample size wasn't large enough. But still, she finds that um, former foster youth are less likely to take the steps to prepare for college. They enroll in college at lower rates. Now, one of the things that I'm sort of talking here, did, I'm going to pause for it. Did I, did I say that if you have any questions, please interrupt? One of the uh, things that you might see as I'm going through this is that I, I sort of have wide, widely varying estimates of like college enrollment rates or college completion rates. And again, that goes back to this question of data that, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, that I talked about and I'll hit on a little bit more here. Um, well, Latin probably did one of the more influential studies for policymakers and actually influenced, I think, some of the federal legislation with this work. But he really sort of comes up with these figures by looking across several studies um, and across several data sets to try and get a sense of this. But he's really sort of doing in many ways, back to the envelope map. There, there aren't really great data out there to, to know what happens to former foster youth once they age out of the system or leave high school. Now, once students get to college, those that do get to college, and, and today I'm talking about that group that gets to college, um, <clears throat> when I get into some of the data, of course, they, they lack uh, institutional supports in some ways. Right, so you probably, if you read the higher ed literature, you've probably seen um, more and more discussion of support programs for former foster youth at colleges and universities. Western Michigan University, um, I think it's a lot of attention and press because they have a very robust program in a lot of ways. And those programs can look very different, um, but they can include things. So, so at Western Michigan University, uh, they have a social worker on site that uh, interacts with the, the um, social services agency in Michigan. They've got uh, academic advisors, they've got financial aid advisors, they've got food pantries, they help make sure students have housing for breaks. A lot of the things that, that may be taken for granted by college university administration in terms of support services, um, that's not common uh, across institutions. That, that's the, the exception in many ways. There's this question of lack of financial support. So former foster youth generally don't or can't rely on familial support. Um, and I'll, we'll, we'll look at some of the financial aid data here in a, in a few minutes. Uh, and then, of course, some of the low completion rates, which I mentioned. Right. Yeah. Um, is, is it mentioned what type of higher institutions they're going to community colleges or like four-year institutions? Yeah, I'll, I'll show some of that. So, and so that was one of the things when I got further into this. I was, so uh, the Lannan's, Tom Lennon's study in 2005 and Jerry Davis' study in 2006 are probably the most recent and most comprehensive national portraits of former foster youth in higher ed, but they really sort of just dig into the financial aid pieces. Um, we didn't really know, and we haven't really known a lot about where they're going, what types of institutions, what does their enrollment look like. So, so you know, when I got into this, I was, I was naive, and I thought well, I'd be able to look at a lot. I, I'd run some and some uh, statistics and some models to look at completion and, and, and all that. And, and this is what I'm going to present today is really just basic descriptive stuff, which I get very excited about, and I hope you will be too, because we haven't seen it before. Um, I haven't seen anything published showing some of this national data. Um, and so this is really just sort of a baseline, right, to answer some of these basic questions. So I, you know, I, I mentioned some of the challenges, but I, but I want to I 
revisit this and sort of drive this point home. Um, and I'm hopeful maybe we can have some discussions about some ways to answer some of the research questions that, that I have and that we may have. So again, when I was looking through this, I thought, okay, well, where can I go find the data to look at this group of people? And you know, if, if an education scholar, I know that we have a lot of uh, federal data sets. And so these, these acronyms up here represent different data sets for different years. Um, and we did a pretty comprehensive review of all the federal data sets related to education and uh, found that many of them don't have anything around former foster youth, and those that do have a really small percentage of the samples. It's NIPSAS, the National Postsecondary Student Aid Study, the most recent available year, 2012, has the largest. And the former foster youth represent about 1.6% of the sample. A problem, though, with those data, and I'm talk a little bit about this here in a second too, is that it's not actually really good data about people's experiences in foster care. So those, those of you that, that study child welfare, social work, would, you know, you know that your experience is what maybe brings you into care, uh, how long you're in care, the number of episodes in care, can make someone look very different than someone who may be in care for, you know, a year when they're young and then goes back into a stabilized birth family. We don't get all that information in these federal data sets. So, so this is one challenge. It's, um, it's not generally collected in the big data sets. Um, NIPSAS is not longitudinal, so it's hard to look at longitudinal education outcomes. And then again, for some of the, the studies that are longitudinal, IES advised me not to use those. So that's one challenge. So then I thought, because I work with state data sets, let me go see what kind of state data we have. And so I started looking around, I was curious what states connect foster care data to their K-12 data to their post-secondary data. And the answer is none, really. The states up here in yellow are the states that do connect their K-12 <coughs> and their foster care data. Now, we don't know, though, so when I work this, these, uh, this comes from the Data Quality Campaign. They, until very recently, did an annual survey of what states, uh, what data elements states collected. So they were able to tell me if they connected the K-12, Data Quality Campaign could tell me if the states connected their K-12 and the foster care data, but, but we don't yet know um, what, so if they connect their data, it may not necessarily mean that they have good, rich data on former foster youth. Is that because of FERPA, or what are, you know, what are the It's a good question. The barriers there? Because I know they're really strong programs in California and Oregon. Well. Yeah, um, I, I would guess, and I should say too, these data are from 2012. Um, so I think I think some of this is changing. I think part of it is very state dependent. So the California, uh, as a state, has very strong programs, but their data sets for their colleges and universities have historically lived in each of the systems. So the community colleges have their own data. The Cal State and the UC systems have their own data. Um, in other states where they are connected, most states connect their data now in pretty robust ways. It could just be that they haven't gotten there yet because of costs associated with it. Uh, so in Wisconsin, we have started connecting our um, foster care data and our K-12 education data, and we're looking to add in some of the post-secondary. So um, we did our first data matches probably in 2010. Oh, wow. And then um, have been really building, using the Institute for Research on Poverty here at UW to help us understand the educational performance of kids in out-of-home care. And so um, we do do that. I don't know uh, who the survey comes from and stuff, but I can say that at the local state agency level, yeah. we are absolutely doing that, and we have a five-year data share agreement with the Department of Public Instruction to make sure that we can continue to have that continue. conversation. And, and is that for the whole state? That's for the whole state, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, and I, when I was I was at Mass Western Michigan last fall, and I was talking to some of the folks there, they're, Michigan's trying to do some of that stuff as well, although I don't think it's statewide at this point. It's a little more localized. So for me, I, you know, this is both a limitation and a frustration and sort of the elephant in the room, right? Uh, when I, when I, you know, the, the data that, that we do have in the federal data sets, it's based on question 53 from the FAFSA. And this is it here. And, that, and it's a problem, right? 
So at any time since you turned age 13, were both your parents deceased? Were you in foster care or were you dependent or ward of the court? And they all get lumped together in the data set. And that doesn't tell us a lot. I have a follow-up question to that because I was going to ask how, how is that distinction made for the type of data that you're looking for? None that I know of that haven't gone through and systematically called states and, and gone through every state's data dictionary. So I, I was telling, uh, Nick, oh, I was telling uh, Nick earlier, so in Kentucky, we, we can tell if you've got foster youth flagged because uh, foreign foster youth are eligible for in-state uh, tuition remission and some fee. But again, it just it lumps everybody together. So, so for example, uh, the little girl that I adopted out of foster care at a year old is going to show up in the data system as a former foster youth, right? And that's very different from the data that Well, and I was just going to say, too, that the, due to this question, it, a person could be 50 and going to school and indicate mm -hmm. that on the FAFSA. So you really do have this broad range. Yeah. You don't really know if a kid aged out of the system or how long they spent in the system or anything. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, this is really a sort of, you, you check yes, you end up with yes on this, then you're, you're, for the most part, you'll be declared financially independent, which gives you financially, should get you more financial benefits. But, but that's really the point of this question. So, so there isn't really, uh, there isn't really any kind of national effort uh, or attempt to collect data. <coughs> it's one of those things, I mean, they, they, they just came out with NIFSAS 2016, they did field testing not too long ago. I just, I wish, I wish, of course, I'm sure a lot of people say it's about whatever they're researching, but I, it wouldn't take that much to add a question, right? To add just a little bit more information. And even if I only did it one year, we would get a lot, we would get a lot, we would gain a lot in terms of educate, higher ed policy. Has there been any effort that you know of at the national level to collect, to connect the, the FHAR, so the um, out-of-home care data with that data set? Not that I know of. Okay. Not that I know of. Because that seems like the best place to start for research. Yeah. Yeah. But this app, so APCARS is, is the, um, I always get one, the Adoption and Foster Care Analysis Reporting System. Right. The U.S. Children's Bureau, right? Yep. Collects that. Is that, are those data, those data reported by states? But are they at the individual level? Do you yes. Know? They're at the they child are. level, okay. and um, every kid who's in out of home care would be in that data set because it's also related to most states, their payment and other sort of things. So that's high quality data. That, that, would, that would be awesome. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> along with other data sources. So if we use like National Student Loan Data System or mm -hmm. National Student Clearing House, uh, we'd be able to learn a lot. Yeah. Um, so I just just briefly, it, it is I think helpful to say just a little bit about foster care. Again, this is um, I, I don't claim to be an expert in, in social worker child welfare. This is really just sort of a, a brief overview of it. In, in case you're not familiar with it, how foster care uh, can sort of generally work. Um, a, a child can enter into care uh, primarily for one or two reasons: voluntary surrender of the child by the birth parents or the custodial family. Um, or the child can be removed. It's generally to be reported to be an investigation. If, if there's an investigation warrant that says that the child should be removed, the child will be placed generally in one of three types of placements. Uh, kinship care, which I think, uh, and I'm looking uh, to folks who studies in this, I think kinship care, that is generally the first preference of the state. Of most states, I know and certainly in Kentucky um, and Michigan it is. Um, then private licensed homes, so, so people like me or maybe some of you that go out and get your home license to, to be a foster parent, and then institutions. Uh, in Kentucky, at least, and I think this is probably the case nationally as well, institutions tend to be reserved for the, the hard place. And so um, what that means is generally the older students. I know at, at one point in Jefferson County, which is where Louisville is located, which has a population of about a million, there were four licensed teenage homes. 
So a lot of those kids that are, are removed from their family at that age will end up going into institutions. And so, so it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of stuff that happens then when a child's removed, a lot of ongoing review, a lot of visits from social workers, uh, judicial oversight, and all of that. The state, it's interesting, is working to always try and, um, and the philosophy has shifted in this country uh, toward one of permanency for the child. So years ago, 20, 25 years ago, uh, for example, uh, they would have moved foster children around, it's not as frequently as possible, but relatively frequently, with the idea being that the child shouldn't get too attached to any particular place. Right now, people shaking their heads, it's, sort of, it's this bizarre notion, right? But now, you know, now they sort of they drill it, they, you know, they drill it into the, the, the philosophy of, of the foster parents, the workers, everyone that moves hurt kids, so they don't want kids to moves, move. And they want permanency, meaning they don't want a kid to stay in care very long, and when they want the kid to go back to somewhere where they can stay for a very long time. So they're concurrent, but they're sort of simultaneously sort of trying to work toward permanency, but also sort of planning for uh, if that child can't be returned um, to its birth family or to a custodial uh, family, um, then the, the child can exit the system, either go return to birth parents, relatives, adoption, or age out. In terms of sort of what these numbers uh, look like, so the 2005, this comes from AFCARS um, for up to 2014, so start on the left, that's 2005, going over to 2014. It's really hard to see, but let's just say it this way. So at any given, uh, if you look in 2005 uh, and look down toward 2015, over time the number of children in foster care has declined overall. I, I'm not sure, and from what I've read, I'm not sure if that's because the need is less or if because they're less likely to uh, put kids into the system than they, than they did in 2005. Does your research indicate um, any caveats to this Category for the youth who just are MIA, who go off if they just leave. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how that goes <coughs> in AFCARS. Essential the trafficking, finding their way on their own. Yeah, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure how that would appear in the, in the data actually from the, the Children's Bureau. It's a good question. That could be one of the reasons the numbers have gone down. Ah, I see. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, and I also think that at least. I think there is this, this preference to not, right? So there's definitely a preference not to remove kids from the homes. Um, I, I'd like to believe that this is, there's a decrease in the need for foster care and that somehow we're doing better in our, our social support systems, but right, if someone has to do that, that'd be great. But as we look over here, so you sort of see the you know, number, number of children that are served, those that were in care on September 30th, each given year entered, it sort of shows you the progression of how the foster care system can work. In any given year, there are about 40,000 or so uh, kids that are adopted out of the foster care system. Most go back to their families. So just to give you a quick, uh, kind of quick snapshot, again in 2014, here's some, some of the basic characteristics of, of kids that were in care. So they tend to be younger, uh, men tend to be overrepresented. And the goal is almost always to go back to family or reunification, and adoption, and per perhaps, <coughs> perhaps not surprisingly to many of us, African American or Blacks and Hispanics are overrepresented. Does this does this number in terms of the amount of time kids spend in care surprise anybody? No. That's months. That's months. Yeah. It surprised me for some reason I thought it was higher. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to ask a question. Going back to, so if the average age, the mean age, I mean, is mm -hmm. 8.7 years old, and then I'm going back to the FAFSA question, mm -hmm. 13 years, I'm trying to make the connection there. So student or kids who are in their below the age of 13, they're not going to be eligible for the financial aid. That's right. If they weren't in care after age 13. That's right. Yeah. No, 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 that's not right. Did I, did I misunderstand this? Yeah. If they're in care after 13. If they're in care after 13. If they're going then to they eligible. Eventually, <coughs> then they were in care prior to 13, they're then not, they're not eligible. eligible. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. sorry, thank you. Yeah, they right. might still be eligible. For the, yeah, okay. 
And that's it. Yeah. yeah. A question about the um, months in care. If a child is placed out and returned to their family and then that doesn't work out and they're placed out again, does that start over when they're calculating that out? Or does that continue on? I, I'm not sure. I think their clock continues. Okay. I'm not I'm not sure how it's reported in our cars. Does anyone so it'll it'll accumulate whatever they're in care for that year. FCARS is an annual data set, so it'll look for if the episode spans to the next year and to the next year and sort of goes across, it'll look at that. But if they have a new a new if they were placed in twenty ten and returned in twenty ten and then they show up again in twenty thirteen and then they're there until twenty sixteen, the twenty sixteen will show three years. <coughs> it won't show the four years, so it won't show the year before. Okay. Thanks. Sure. There is an additional question on the FAFSA that just started last year that just asks were you ever in foster care, yeah. but it has no bearing on their financial aid at all. It's just a social engineering question. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't it doesn't give you any more breakdown. It just kind of puts a flag down for every kid. I'm just wondering, so after 13 years old, do these racial demographics carry out for that group, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. <coughs> yeah. Does anyone? So after kids are 13 years old, does this racial breakdown play out to be about the same for that population? So I'm thinking like the kids who are eligible for independent status for eventually. Children who are black and African American end up staying longer and longer and longer. And longer. So that's one. and the older they are and the longer they are in care, the less likely they are to be reunified with family. Less likely to be adopted in what are the choices. Less likely to be guardian, guardianship with kin and so on. Okay. Your best chances of getting out of, out of foster care are early and young. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I know in, in some states, I, I think they, they incentivize, they intentionally incentivize the adoption of um, kids of color. Right? So I know in, in Kentucky, and I think Indiana, probably other states, I've been to this first state. But you, if you are an African American uh, child that comes into a care, you are immediately identified as special needs, and then that carries with it additional supports from the state because they are hard because they are less likely to be adopted. Yes. Adoption for for several years was promoted as the cost saving alternative to save all children in care. And the judges and companies were doing all kinds of promotion. Hopefully that is diminishing now, since most foster placement is caused by poverty. Mm -hmm. And when income is low, foster placement rates are high. There's no way that adoption is going to ever solve that. Right. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so to, to get to you, sort of what I found in the, the Data. I want to. What I'm going to present, with the exception of some of the financial aid data, is, is I'm going to be focusing on the 2012 data from uh, the National Postsecondary Student Aid System. So these are represents. It's representative of all undergraduates in the U.S. So to be clear, these are the students that got to college. Right? So I'm not looking at college enrollment rates. It's just that's not in this da data set. It's in other data sets, but again, I was advised with the sample size being so low, they said look at these data sets. So that, that's um, frustrating. I'm presenting 2012 data, but I went back um, up to 2000, so these four different data sets, to sort of see if there were, if, if some of these relationships that I'm going to present here kind of hold. And the reason I wanted to do that uh, was because I'm, I'm sort of presenting some descriptive stuff here. But also, be, again, because the sample sizes, even of this, are fairly low, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't getting kind of a blip in the data, so to speak, which I think if you look at like 2000, you see that happening because some of the, some of the relationships here, some of the, the distributions look very different than other years. Is this both in two-year and four-year schools? It is, yeah. It is. So again, it's representative of all students enrolled in post-secondary education. Um, post-secondary education 2012, and I should note, unless there, so these are all statistically significant differences unless there's an asterisk um, by the variable. 
So you know, in terms of some of the, just the basic demographic characteristics, uh, I, I would say that the students uh, in higher education, I should say, to just to be clear as we're going through these, uh, this column, the no, represents the students who did not, who answered question 53, no. And these are sort of the, the students that answered the question yes to 53. So former foster youth, but also uh, parents who were deceased, um, or students are um, kids who are aged out of the system, uh, or wards of the court, et cetera. So in, in I think many ways, you know, the, in terms of the gender and the racial ethnic uh, breakdown, it mirrors what we saw and see in the population of uh, folks that are in foster care, children that are in foster care. African Americans are overrepresented relative to the overall student population. Interestingly, um, Hispanic Latino students are not in this case. Um, you know, in terms of parents' education level, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, students that uh, were in uh, foster care, I'm just going to use that as shorthand to be clear, but, uh, students who were in foster care were a little bit less likely, or were more likely not to know their parents' education level, and overall their parents were less educated, uh, formally educated. They were a little more likely to have dependent children. Anything about any of that surprise, folks? I'll strike you. So I'm struck by the fact that mm -hmm. males are overrepresented in the foster care population, but then underrepresented. Underrepresented. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, but it's, I think, yeah, so I think what, what we see there, though, is it's interesting is that, I mean, men overall, right, are less likely, are, don't, aren't enrolling um, in college at the same rates. And, but we don't see a difference there between uh, kids that were in foster care and uh, students, excuse me, students that were in foster care and students that weren't. Is there a correlation there to juvenile justice? Pardon? Is there a correlation uh, to that's juvenile interesting. justice? Could be, yeah. So looking at some of the uh, enrollment characteristics once, once folks are enrolled in college, again, I was curious, you know, did, did, did students, did they take dual enrollment or uh, high school or college credits while in high school? What, what did they major in? And then uh, what were the degree programs they were enrolled in? So, uh, you know, former foster youth were a little less likely, or fewer of them earned college credits in high school. They enrolled in general studies and, and other, um, as well as business and other applied fields at higher rates than non-foster youth. And I think that's probably related to that they tend to enroll in the associate's degree programs. Looking at a few more college enrollment characteristics, they were more likely to delay enrollment in post-secondary education more likely to be enrolled half-time, to take remedial courses, to be enrolled at public institutions, and to be enrolled in uh, community colleges. And their undergraduate GPA was lower. So I was, uh, being someone that has spent some time looking at financial aid, I, I was really sort of curious uh, what financial aid looked like over time for these students. And honestly, I would say that it was probably about what I would expect, which these students are going to have higher expected family contribution because they're independent. They're going to be getting more need-based aid. They're going to be taking out more loans. And I don't know if this necessarily surprised me. It maybe it disappointed me. It certainly suggests something to look at more. But by and large, they're getting far less from their institutions than students who are not on the foster unit. What are, what are some of your thoughts about that? Does that surprise you? What do you think, what do you think is going on there? Reflection of the types of institutions they're in? Reflection of the types of institutions. <coughs> 
likely to be in for profit that we have a question about how they're getting access to those um, Chaffee funds or Chaffee, Chaffee, Chaffee funds. Chaffee funds. And yeah. Those, how, how do those trickle down? How do those show up? How, how are they distributed you know, like when they get to the state? How has it been? My understanding is that it varies, okay. the Chaffee funds. So it's so federal funding. Right, that is support, supposed to support, support former foster youth uh, once they sort of leave the system, right? Um, it, in Kentucky, it comes through in the form of a waiver. I, I'm not sure how other states do it. In Wisconsin, um, it, it's education training vouchers, that's the pot of funding mm -hmm. that you get for full secondary education, and it's not through the school, it's not part of the financial aid package. It's handled as a separate way. You know, some yeah. states handle it as a scholarship, others grants, whatever they call it. But I wonder too, what we experience is that our kids apply for college late. Mm -hmm. They fill out their FAFSA yeah. in August, and yeah. so you know, some of the best aid is. Yeah. Which could be contribution. Contribute to that. Yeah. But in Wisconsin too, there's no deadline, whereas in other states like New York or Illinois or California, there's a pro there's a priority deadline in terms of the yeah. to qualify for the better or the best forms of state funds. Like in New York they're they're tagged or they're tippering because I'm from New York State. Okay. So like that's why I knew as a kinship foster care student, I knew I got in my FAFSA like by March 1st yeah. or March 15th, regardless of where I applied. And so whereas like right now, uh, we're working with students where, yeah, they may not file their FAFSA yeah. if they're doing it by themselves, um, because they don't know how to, to fill out the FAFSA. Because well, their high school guidance counselors may not necessarily know how the system, so they come into the financial aid office to get assistance or they're yeah. getting family or friends. Yeah, I think the number of states we use that they set those deadlines is really sort of a rationing mechanism, right? They know they don't have enough money to go around, so they set the de prior deadlines, and then if you miss it, you don't, you're less likely to get the aid. Um, I mean, the institutional, the, the institutional money, I think, really strikes me, like in terms of thinking about what is, you know, where where do I go next with some of this work, and and, and what sort of you know, somebody thinks about policy and then thinks about like how we actually take this stuff and translate. Like I think there's an interesting conversation here around, uh, and this isn't just for lower foster, this is for low income students generally, but what are institutions, those that have the resources to, to provide financial aid, who is that going to, right? And how is it supporting sort of the broader mission of higher education in this country? You and I had an offline conversation and you know, most universities if they're part of a system, there's a certain, there's an application. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is pretty universal like the UW system. That's one. So if they don't have a category, a box, yeah. you, know, you don't know. And if it's not a priority of the chancellor and the campus leadership, so you got two strikes. Yeah. And the third one, as you and I exchange, is more universities like the elite universities like UW Madison, they are now adopting the common app. You saw what, what they what they don't have. So my point is, yeah. most universities have no idea uh, if it's not on the box, <laughs> right? They will add, like the UW added the question, "Are you a legacy student?" See, yeah, that's important to them. Yeah. But are you a former Foster? That, as of right now, is not an important question. And then that leads directly into institutional aid, either merit or need based aid. Yeah, I mean, your question was good about whether you'd ask um, whether or not it was included on the Common App, and the answer is no. You can, you, there's an other box, and you can fill it in. Right. But, but I think that that um, demonstrates, I think, a certain a lot of assumptions about people's familiarity with how the financial aid systems work. Yeah. And if, honestly, I don't, I don't care where your background is. If you spend any time studying financial aid and how it works on campuses, you know it's complicated. You're gonna have a PhD and still not understand it. <laughs> right? You know, though, on the, the smaller state campuses, um, there are a couple hundred people maybe who help review those scholarship applications and who read those essays and who comment and score 
uh, yeah. when they when they see red flags like you could then uh, in difficult times, and and I think that's that's maybe more of a leveling factor on the comprehensive four year and some of the other schools that it might be here. Um, and you know certainly our um, grants like that come through our foundation office, so there's there's also an interest in culling alumni and children of alumni. Yeah. But it's it's a little more level down. It seems, it seems to you from a policy perspective that you know youth may think that if they've already checked the box on the financial aid saying that they were in foster care, that would get them access to whatever may be happening on campus. Yeah. And I think that that's an area where, you know, for campuses that are starting to do some of the more robust programs for foster youth, figuring out the way because I don't think people want to disclose to the actual to a physical person at the campus that they you know are former foster youth unless there's some reason to do that. And yeah. so, you know, until there are sort of well advertised programs like some of the states that have, you know, tuition waiver mm -hmm. and stuff like that, I think that there's not a huge incentive other yeah. than, you know, the financial aid aspect, but to actually let the university know I might need some extra help. Yeah. And then also to have people who know what there are, what things are there for students who are in foster youth. That research that you presented earlier said that student affairs being educated about the needs of foster youth, that's lacking at yeah. a lot of institutions. So there's also a matter of confidentiality, which is part of the problem. It, financial aid offices have that information mm -hmm. via the FAFSA, but then how do they share that out? Um, can they let people know that there are students on their campuses? And at least within the UW system, that's a question that you know different people have different ideas or approaches yeah. to that. So it's sometimes it's trying to be respectful and yet in some ways disadvantages that yeah. student. Yeah, that's a good point. Hi, yeah, so I'm at Scout and we kind of are starting to navigate starting a program and we have the same problems of, so we have this data on the FAFSA, but we can't find out about it and our financial aid office would get in serious trouble if they were the ones to disclose. So thankfully this program was kind of brainstormed <laughs> by our former director of admissions who had some pull and got on our admissions survey the question that said, were you ever in foster care? Yes or no? Yeah. If yes, are you interested in additional supports? Yes or no? And if they answered yes to both of those questions, then we were we were given the list of names and allowed to contact them. You know, the other thing, if I can expose the good people from UW staff back here, um, <laughs> they have a, a program, Fostering Success. It's very visible on their website. It's very upfront. Um, they are actually reaching out and making their priorities known to students that apply to that campus. That makes a huge difference. Yeah. So that those individuals that are applying for admission to UW staff know there's something in it for them. There's a caring community. There's you know all kinds of help with their I forget what you call it the closet the we have a the linen closet yeah. you know the, those kinds of things. So I think. When we talk about student affairs not being very attentive, um, it's I'm of the opinion that University of Wisconsin staff is blazing a trail in the UW system for the kinds of activities that we should all be engaged in. Yeah. Yeah. And I would I would imagine I mean so that in institutions where you have those robust supports, but there's also a, there's a visibility that, that perhaps what's also happening with the, the staff that work there is there's this sort of Having students that are from foster youth maybe becomes less stigmatized, right? So they're being educated, right, and understanding that, that it is about, at the end of the day, it's really a lot about poverty sure. in terms of why people end up in foster care. So I guess what I can say is our supports, is, is supports are really not all that robust. Frankly, I mean, us two and a third. Frankly, I mean, we're just going to build up here, too. <laughs> Um, and don't know about the internships that are specifically out there for foster youth. And then um, I'm a foster care alumni myself, so that connection and stigma piece where they, they build this rapport and understand there's no judgment happening, yeah. um, I think that's also really pivotal in why they will come to our office when they're struggling and, and yeah, and, and just the idea that our campus um, acknowledges them. Yeah. We, we did bring just if people want to glance at it later, one document that we share with students, we're also sharing with social workers 
independent living counselors, and Chris works with um, school guidance counselors. We're doing those kind of dog and pony shows around West Central Wisconsin and expanding our circle, hopefully to do more regional presentations about possibilities for you. And I think one of the, I mean, one of the really kind of important areas for, for us to look next is to look at these programs, right? To begin to develop sort of a, almost typologies, but just sort of what, what do these programs look like? What are the variations? What are the commonalities across institutions? What supports do they provide? And then can we help programs, right? Researchers, can we help evaluate these programs and see what their effects are? And one of, one of the questions I have, I'm curious about given the data we've looked at, is how many of these programs are at four-year institutions versus community colleges? I know in California, they have, I think, robust supports for the community colleges, but I'm curious, outside of California, right, what does that look like? Because if they're mostly four-year institutions, they're doing important work, but from a policy perspective, we need to be supporting the community colleges, right? Because that's where most of the students are. Well, I think, too, if you look at the support that's given to international students at a lot of four-year institutions and community colleges, you know, when we started looking at this first from the department, we were looking at housing and technical colleges, which is largely unavailable and an enormous barrier to kids in foster care. And a lot of them said, oh, well, we have housing for international students. How would we expect them to be able to come here? Yeah, yeah. You know, and so like thinking about that, and thinking about kids who, when they leave foster care, they also don't have a place to live. And starting that conversation from the, you know, four-year and technical college side to say, if we want these, you know, young people here, we have to have housing options over breaks. Yeah. Housing options at all at technical colleges. Yeah. My name is Terry Muir and I work for UW Colleges. And I'm working on a couple of initiatives right now in the greater Milwaukee area, trying to connect some dots. There's a lot of agencies and a lot of special programs working, primarily with all low income, first generation higher than you, not just foster you. But anyway, all that to say, prior to coming here in 2011, I worked in Arizona at a community college. And we did a lot of programming with foster. And, and I'm, I'm just wondering what's going on here in Wisconsin. Very disconnected, quite frankly. Um, and I guess maybe Arizona. I would never hold Arizona for anything. <laughs> <laughs> I totally know Arizona. So. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, will tell, I will tell you, though, the reason why Arizona is ahead of the game, in my opinion, uh, as, as a, in working with foster youth and, and post-secondary education, is because there were some champions in the state legislature. One of whom was a Republican, one of whom was a Democrat, and it really made a difference. So every time I ask this question, I get a blank stare. <laughs> but I'm going to ask it anyway. Are there any legislators that anyone knows of that has a, a passion for, um, who, who might be willing to champion? Because there are a lot of programs. There are a lot of agencies and a lot of places that I'm going to hopefully be able to connect with colleges, since we're, there's no community colleges in, in Wisconsin, um, we're the closest thing to it, I guess you could say, in terms of the two year old art. But is there anyone that anyone knows that it will, uh, in the legislative area, that, that might be someone to contact? From UW Stout, who's your senator or, or representative? Do you, do you yeah, know? Um, so Ron Kind is on. I mean, Wisconsin, not US. Oh, um, Wisconsin. Yeah. Well, we have, we have Sheila Hardstore. And she's chair of the Higher Committee, yes, the Joint is. Finance uh -huh. Committee. She would be critical. Well, and, and Greta is actually a research assistant at the Joint Finance Committee. Yeah. Yeah. So she's been working with Greta So there's some possibilities here to connect. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. Right. This is just kind of like a, a question, and I guess it's too nuanced given the data limitations to answer. But so with the, with the last slide around mm -hmm. the different types of aid that are coming towards, so we know 
we know that there's there's inequities in debt load when students get out. Students of color are way overburdened. And then when you think about then students of color being overrepresented in the foster youth population. I'm wondering who within you know students of color within foster youth, mm -hmm. what kind of access are they getting equitable access to to, to, to financial aid or not? And given that they they apply late and other things, yeah. what what are we doing for our what's their debt load looking like and how inequitable is it compared to white foster youth? Or is it not? I don't know. That's a good question. I, yeah, I don't know, but, but I can tease that out with the, this data. Oh. Just, I mean, I can, I can look at who applies for aid. There are questions about why we don't apply for aid. I mean, so you can tease it out and see how that may vary by race or ethnic group for foster youth. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is the samples with numbers will start to get low, so I have, right. but right. I, can, I can try. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, one, two. Sorry. <laughs> so so in, in these comparisons, I think it's important to distinguish, you know, you're making a comparison here between foster youth and non-foster youth, but, you know, almost all of the children who have foster youth experience are probably facing pretty severe economic disadvantages, but there are large numbers of children who aren't in foster youth are also yeah. economic. It seems to me to sort of think about the right comparisons, and then, and then to what extent do, does being a, a former foster, in foster care, impose additional barriers yeah. or obstacles to, to success in, in college, above and beyond economic disadvantage. Yeah. We're also um, exploring relationships with group homes and um, small nonprofits, some faith-based organizations. Like Amtrak in Milwaukee is bringing a group of eight youth and their mentors to our campus in a couple of weeks where they're going to stay overnight, get a taste of the campus, meet with a panel of students from a variety of backgrounds, and um, really, you know, just trying to grassroots this as best we can yeah. before we splash into the world. But the possibilities are endless of this group. And you do a summer free college program, which also we, we we have summer free college on our campus through our Aspire Trio and MSS office, Multicultural Student Services. We also do a summer overnight experience for youth. We have um, small grants from the Women's Giving Circles of Eau Claire and Dunn County, and a, a very um, generous private donor to our our campus foundation who is in love with this program in part because. In their family, they fostered youth. Yeah. I was going to say that the Chapin Hall study um, does um, one of the series that they follow kids at age 17, 19, 21, 23, and they do compare it to um, what they call the ad hoc health sample, which is an average population. Mm -hmm. And the foster youth data is still quite um, different. And one of the states included in that is Wisconsin. Wisconsin yeah. um, and then I, there's um, what's called the National Youth in Transition Database. We've only been getting data on that since 2010, I believe. Um, but the, it played out in the Chapin Hull study, and it's playing out in the what we call the NIDID data that the number one reason that youth are indicating that they're not in education at age 19 and 21 is finances, the inability to pay, yeah. which is, should not be the case. Yeah. Yeah. So just a, kind of a few other things looked at here. With the data. So it's kind of want to dig in a little bit more um, in terms of the and financial characteristics for 2012. So I was curious how much of these students working, what are their debt loads? I, I put some of this up here. I, I was curious, uh, and this is for you, Nick, uh, how far people live from their institutions. Uh, <laughs> um, a little bit of that, but not, but not much uh, there. Um, You know, I guess I, I don't know if I was surprised or not to see that uh, there really wasn't any difference between the two groups in terms of those that had a job at all. And the hours worked uh, there were sort of greater with the former foster youth. Um, but I don't know why, but not quite as high as I expected. Help me understand, 
what I'm looking at as, a, as I'm looking at receipt number of benefits and I understand all the, the various assistance programs, I know what they are, but right. what, what, what is the percentage is telling you? The, the percentage that receives. Yeah, of that whole uh, block from where it says receive. Yeah, you're actually asking what the percentages represent? Uh-huh. These are the percentages of students who reported receiving these benefits. Oh, okay. Yeah. One thing I, I couldn't quite understand in looking at the, da the data are why, why the free or reduced price school lunch is lower for the fo former foster youth than the non-former foster youth. That, that, I, that I can't explain. I'm not sure why that's the case. I would expect that. I think on one of the earlier slides you had the percentage with children who are in college with children. Mm -hmm. so yeah, it's dependents, so maybe. And it's, it's higher for the foster youth. A little bit it was, yeah. yeah. So just sort of um, kind of wrapping up a, a, a little bit here. I mean, I, I think some of this really isn't terribly surprising in terms of sort of what we found here. I think that um, you know a lot of former foster youth have these so-called risk indicators, right? So delayed enrollment, uh, part-time enrollment, enrollment at community colleges, higher uh, levels of financial need. These are all things that we know from other uh, research suggests that students are less likely to complete college. I, I think some of the, and more, for me, the more interesting things that come out of this is that higher enrollment community colleges. Um, and so I think that, as I sort of mentioned earlier, I think that speaks to, right, so looking at maybe pulling apart the data as much as possible in small sample size, but pulling apart the data to look at some of these differences by types of institution. Also, I think that it, it had these questions about what kinds of support programs exist at community colleges. Um, and, you know, this, this question of appropriate comparison group is, you know, is key, right? So I'm, I'm comparing former foster youth to all students. Right? So maybe we do need to break it out by low-income students or, di or different types of groups there. And then I still come back, uh, for me, I still come back to this, to this data question. I'm really still struggling with this. right? Because I, I, can, I can get some, uh, I can, you know, there's more to be done with this, but we still lack a lot of that good information um, at the national level that has a lot of the good education data and probably the good foster care. Data. I mean, it sounds like you know, if we can merge half cars and some of these federal data sets, then, then we'd be able to learn a lot more. And it might be that doing that with a few states might be a good starting point. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we do that here. I would imagine that there's probably at least a few other states that do that, and that that would be really informative because you'd have a bigger sample already. You know, and that might be good to push it forward. Yeah. I think the, uh, in terms of the next steps on this, I'm also, I, there, there aren't a lot of great, I, I don't think great college outcome variables in this de data set, um, but there are some, like credit accumulation and all that. I think that's kind of the next step of some of this. And then I think honestly looking at the state data, as imperfect as it is, it's gonna allow us to do a lot more because there's just, there's a, the sample size are a lot bigger in it. I would recommend that you contact people at Foster Club Mm -hmm. or in some of the, the national organizations where, where youth are actually at the table mm -hmm. and, and to do those focused interviews asking the youth what, what they think of this and what, yeah. what their perspective on it and why might this be and why that. That's, that's, that's yeah. what we're that's finding right. is most effective is, is if we ask and put the youth at the table yeah. and empower them. So another thought I have here is coming at this from the higher education perspective, this, this seems like you know a fine way to look at it with all I mean, given all the data limitations. Coming at it from the foster care, from the child welfare side of the mm -hmm. question, I mean it's really important to remember how selective this I mean this how selective the group of children who are in foster care who actually make it into college yes. at all is. Yeah. And so, I mean, we're really talking about, you know, a, uh, a cherry-picked sample here. But if we're thinking yeah. about this yeah. from, the, from the greater population of foster care yeah. involved children. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really important point to drive home. So just kind of combining the two, it would lend itself to find out some of the cultural capital, social capital that some of these students are picking up on because like it's, it is a cherry picked group of students and I think delving deeper beyond kind of like numbers would be beneficial to programs who want to enhance or increase numbers of foster students that are at universities and institutions yeah. and do better programming. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> a couple things. One, I'm just looking through the um, case 
social perspective, mm -hmm. um, how how is this information? I, and I'm just thinking about the I, I keep wanting to call it Chafee. It's Chafee, right? Yeah. Those Chafee funds, you know, or other opportunities like that. How is that communicated to you or foster families through through this process? Because I'm when we talk about access. Um, <laughs> And I don't, I don't know, I didn't see any demographics of uh, foster families, but uh, based on data that I've seen, a great deal of them are first generation, I mean, are low income themselves, mm -hmm. many first gen, so they don't have that legacy of higher ed yeah. to share either. So I think it would be interesting to look at how, at what point, the, we have some resources available, how do, how do we make that connection? Uh, it was just, Disjointed, and the I didn't see the connection between the first gen. I think first generation uh, is another yeah. uh, comparison group, and, and again, there's a lot of overlap with <coughs> first generation uh, low income uh, youth as well. I I uh, just want to make a note that it's it's one o'clock, we're up to one thirty. Uh, but it sounds like your formal presentation is done. Oh, it is. So, yeah. so yes. Yes. <laughs> So my, um, my only two comments here are first to just keep this conversation going. I do not want to disrupt it uh, by doing this, but I do want to be sure you got uh, you know, your recognition for the full presentation. Oh, yeah. but, um, the other part is that, even more of an ending. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, is that when, so when we the federal government would love to simplify the facts and get rid of this one little, the single question, right, that we have. So what do you see as sort of some of those next barriers that might prevent you from doing this? And I guess, the other maybe third part of this is that the financial aid research, you know, I've talked about this yes. for years. Financial aid research has gotten very boring very fast. We're, look, we're reproducing the same studies over and over again. So this was a special moment. Like this is a new, this is a totally new ground in financial aid research. So I think that uh, is really remarkable. This conversation was just, just been wonderful too. So I hope it's helping. Yeah, yeah, this has yeah, been very helpful. And I appreciate. It. Thank you all of you for coming, but also for me. Really great feedback. I think as you saw, you sort of jotting down notes here because this is very much the, the start of this journey for me. Um, I, I think that you know, just some of the comments and suggestions. I think what's interesting about what you're saying Nick, is that I think this is kind of that chance for us to do in our financial aid work to do more than just include income or first gen status as variables in this, right? I mean, and, and I would say qualitative research is financial aid have done a little bit more than, than quantitative folks in that area, but. I think this is a chance to really go back and look at I mean, these comments about the foster families and the families where people are coming from and to include more information about that. It's important, especially if we get the data. Um, you know, there's some research also on the persistence, so kids who enroll and then sort of dwindle off over time, and it would be really interesting to overlap that with some of the financial aid research that you're doing. Yeah. Because as you are there and leave and there and leave, you, your opportunity for financial aid and different funding sources becomes less. And so that would be really interesting because these kids don't follow a typical trajectory. And so if you were able to link yeah. some of that stuff together by research, I think we may have a good argument to try to expand the way that we think about financial aid for this non-traditional student population. Yeah, and that's, that's the thing. That's so most of my work is, is longitudinal, right, yeah. and looking at those sort of how enrollment is so fluid and right. how students are mobile and all that, and that's what I kind of really want to do next with some of the state data sets, um, which again, it's not great foster care or, or, or any kind of information about the, the, the prior to college, but we can look at, start to get a sense of the patterns of enrollment and whether or not those differ from other groups. Yeah, I think it's a great suggestion. Um, I was struck by the comments about um, a couple weeks ago, I went to a panel on uh, veteran students, mm -hmm. and it, there's a lot of overlap. That you know, that they're coming into college a little bit later. Um, they often are not clear of like when they're supposed to be applying for different, you know, registering classes, applying for different uh, things within the process. Um, the more likely to have children or families. And I, I thought that was it's interesting overlap. I don't. Obviously, they have a completely different uh, funding. Yes. And, and it's huge support. compared to yes. Boston. Yes, and it's, it's, it's huge. But yeah, um, I thought that was huge. Yes, but actually, I thought about this issue. I mean, there, there's, there are, um, there's data on active military and former military in this, in this data set. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see if there were similarities. 
Any, any other comments, suggestions, questions? I'll just make a little comment before everybody's gone. Um, thanks to um, the Department of Children and Families, um, there is a group in Wisconsin called Foster Youth to College. Mm -hmm. and Thank you. Um, <laughs> it includes representation from um, public campuses, UW, um, technical, private colleges, the Department of Children and Families, um, the Department of Public Instruction, and though we are completely unfunded, um, <laughs> we do try to make at least a very have a very small positive or proactive impact on this population. And one of the things that we've done is identify uh, foster youth contact on every campus, not for profit campus in the state of Wisconsin. So every public, private, or technical college has a person who's identified on our campuses to assist removing some of the barriers that often foster youth face when enrolling. Um, what we've experienced early on before these people existed was many times these individuals will hit a barrier and they turn and run the other way. They simply don't enroll, whatever it is. Financial aid, admission, advising, orientation, and on and on and on. So we've identified a person on every campus. You have a person on the UW-Madison campus who serves in that role. Um, Bobby Jean, St. Arnold, and I'm having a 60s, you know. I can't remember what her married name is. Hurt. Hurdle? Hurt. 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 Bobby Jean Hurt in your admissions office is that contact person on the UW-Madison campus. So if any of you um, encounter a student that's in, that has hit barriers or issues or whatever, Bobby Jean should be able to help navigate and get that student beyond um, those issues. The point is not to refer them to financial aid or to the registrar or whatever. Um, the point is to actually help and assist them. So um, keep that in mind. Is there a directory for all There of is on the Department of Children and Families website. Okay. Um, it will identify for you a contact on, like I said, each public, private, technical college campus. So even if you encounter someone on the Madison campus, maybe someone's transferred, or maybe someone in a pre-college program that's thinking about another UW campus or another um, campus in Wisconsin, you can access that list. And um, these people sadly are um, not paid for their work. It's not included in their job descriptions. They are volunteers. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I was just thinking about the comment about getting legislators on board. And I mean, the, this kind of work just begs for qualitative research around it. I mean, I want to hear the stories, and that's what we'll do with research people. Do you know of any qualitative research out there that's talking about this? Or is that not yet broken? So um, during Foster Care Awareness Month, which is in May, Foster Club and um, Foster Care Alumni of America and others sent foster youth to D.C. Um, and train them on advocacy and how to talk to their lawmakers and legislators so that when they go to the Hill, they can advocate for themselves in a, a more impactful way. Mm -hmm. So um, that application is open now. So if you know of any foster youth in Wisconsin who would be interested in that opportunity, it's four days. Last year, it included a a visit to the White House, and then there were champions of change who were foster care alumni being honored. So they got to meet with those other young people who are role models and, and see you know what's possible. Um, so so that's one thing that has been really effective. What we've heard when when good laws pass is that it's the stories that the, the legislator heard, it's the individual that they met from their you know district who who made that difference for them, and they said that can't be happening. Okay, let's do something. And our experience probably the greatest challenge to getting that qualitative data is convincing students that it's okay to talk to yet another someone who's yeah. going to take another report, you know, another survey or another evaluation block when they've been doing that for so long. Yeah. So, so it, you know, so it's a trust building process. Um, along those lines, too, we have a um, Foster Youth Advisory Council at the Department of Children and Families, and those youth are very good speakers and have been speaking. Um, there was a um, one of the Family Impact Seminars at the Capitol a few months ago, and they were a panel of speakers there. Um, and we also have a Foster Youth Graduation event at the Governor's Residence every year, so um, we didn't talk about it much here, but 
just high school graduation is a pretty big accomplishment for a lot of these kids, and our high school graduation rate is at 56% right now, um, compared to more than 90% statewide. So we try to celebrate those successes, and then we have youth, um, you know, who who can speak to that kind of stuff, but it's a matter of connecting them to those opportunities, which can be um, a lot of work for DCF, but really important work, and so, um, you know, that's a good I think what might be really helpful is for those of you who who have this still 15 minutes on your calendar, stick around and uh, talk with each other, talk with Jake, exchange information, but uh, hopefully we can get some great collaborations out of this. So maybe we just transition to that stage here. Jake's around. So again, thanks very Thank much. Thank you. For all.